over to Kate, but before Kate makes her input, let me introduce Kate to you properly. Kate Tissington is Senior Researcher and Advocacy Officer at CERI, which is the Socioeconomic Rights Institute. Prior to joining CERI in January 2010, Kate was a researcher at the Center for Applied Legal Studies at the University of the Witwatersrand. She has a BA with honors in history from Rhodes University and an MPhil in development studies from Cambridge University. She completed the certificate in housing policy development and management from the School of Public and Development Management at Wits University in 2008. Kate has researched and written on water and sanitation delivery by local government, informal settlement upgrading, inner city evictions, and informal street trading. Thanks for joining us, Kate. Uh, thanks, Fazila, um, and good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to say thanks a lot for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my colleague, Jackie Dugo, was supposed to be here. Unfortunately, she, she had to do something else. So I've taken her place. Um, I think this is an extremely important topic, um, and really it does underpin most of, of Siri's work. I mean, the questions which were posed, um, I think, are exactly the kind of bigger issues that we, we are facing at Siri. Um, and, and really, um, I feel like the other speakers have, have, have covered a lot of, of ground already, and I think Tembani particularly, um, in speaking about the work of Abat Lali in, in Durban, uh, we, we very much see ourselves as a support organization for social movements and communities. So that's sort of where we take our cues from in terms of assisting with either litigation assistance or re research or advocacy. So we try to combine those. But really, um, we work very much on the ground in informal settlements and then um, in the inner city of Johannesburg as well. Um, and, and, and really, our work is sort of largely focused on protecting and extending poor people's access to well-located land and housing in the city. So that's sort of where we, we, we've, we've mainly done, in the past, uh, eviction work, resisting evictions, pushing local government to provide alternative accommodation when people are being evicted or shacks are being demolished. Um, but we've also more recently moved into trying to push for solutions, so trying to push um, for more proactive um, interventions by government and, to some extent, the private sector. Um, I just, I mean, I had an experience recently on Tuesday where, I mean, I think this, this issue of how far we still have to go in terms of um, transforming the apartheid spatial landscape really hits me. Um, I sat for three hours in a queue <laughs> in, uh, to get um, for, at a high school to apply for a place for my child for next year. And it was very clear during those three hours just how broken and unfair the system is. I mean, obviously, this, is, this was at the intersection between access to education and the sort of lingering spatial um, inequalities that exist. And, and you see, and I saw firsthand the kind of anger and frustration that people, that people were, were um, exhibiting there. And it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's bad. Um, the perverse incentives that people have as well in order to try and just gain access to the city, to sort of, um, formerly excluded people to actually access the city, um, education, it, um, housing, whatever. I mean, in all respects, the odds are against them. Um, and I think there's a lot that needs to be changed um, in terms of that. And I think, you know, for us at Siri, we, we mainly work at the intersection where people, I mean, I, I don't like the phrase, but a lot of other people do, where it's the sense of, you know, people are, people are doing it for themselves. I mean, people are in the absence of a of a state solution. And I mean, people have already mentioned that the problem with the, the sort of focus on um, giving ownership to people um, on the periphery of cities as being a sort of one size fits all approach for, for a long time um, and, and not focusing on other interventions. And the fact that people have, over the years, you know, moved on to land. I mean, informal settlements, most informal settlements in Joburg and in Kuraleni where we work, I mean, people moved on there in the late 80s, 1990s, and have been living there for a long time. They are facing eviction from that land um, in, in many cases, and are trying to push for, for those elements to be upgraded, because while I think in some respects they might seem um, on the periphery of maybe the main centers, they generally are a result of people being access to, uh, able to access economic opportunities there, and so they are well located for people, but they've also become well, lo well located for business, for commercial or um, uh, retail purposes as well. So there's sort of a, this contestation is going on, and I think the, the absence of 
um, municipalities or a local go a pro poor development or local government perspective um, to actually deal with this is, is what is fundamentally the problem. I mean, we speak about the right to the city, and, and I think Tambani really um, encapsulated in his, in his talk what that is. I mean, in terms of sort of accessing the city, being part of, part of planning, participating in the city, issues of governance. And um, that's really, I mean, as well as obviously all of the material, um, the material um, gains which are to be made in the city, housing, water, electricity, education, health, all of that. So I think, you know, in terms of sort of understanding it as a package, there's very little of that at, at local government level. And those are, at, at the moment, that's where really all of the kind of policies and, and laws and um, regulations are, are governing how people are accessing the city and are actually, in many, many cases, criminalizing attempts by people to do it, to do it for themselves, quote unquote. Um, and I think, I mean, in the inner city of Joburg, we see that in, in some of the bad buildings that we work, work in, which are, you know, really, I mean, in, in many respects, they're slum buildings. I mean, there actually are shacks set up in a lot of these buildings. Um, and people have also lived there for a very long period of time. And because of the, the drive, the, um, I think similar to what Renato was talking about in Berlin, the sort of the, the increasing attractiveness of the inner city of Joburg, there is a drive to, to, to buy buildings, to renovate them, to, to do, um, you know, loft apartments, but not even the very expensive stuff. The stuff that is, you know, kind of... Um, 2,000 rand a month rent, which is very, which is unaffordable to, to the majority of people who not only live in the inner city, but also live in Joburg. Um, I think Louise spoke to that in terms of how many people, more than half of the population of Joburg earns less than 3,200 rand a month. And these are not people who are generally, necessarily informally employed. I mean, if you think about minimum wages, we're talking about domestic workers, security guards. We're talking about people who are formally employed at minimum wage. <coughs> sorry, cleaners in shops, they're, they're earning, you know, 2,000 and something, 3,000 rand a month. So the sort of the disjuncture between what people are earning in terms of wages and what is available in terms of, terms of affordability, there's a massive gap. And I think what people have had to do is to resort to an informal, informal market. So we, we're really talking about people who are, you know, renting, and, and this is all rental. People, in terms of inf the informal market, it's all rental, and it's actually at, at quite a high premium. So... Um, we did some research in the inner city recently, um, and it was looking at the informal market. I mean, in places like Yeovil and Hillbrow, you know, people... Okay, thanks. People um, are paying, you know, a thousand rand for a room in a, in a flat. They're paying, you know... Um, we saw an exa examples of people sharing, sharing beds. So at different times, you would, you would, you would get the bed, um, especially if people worked late shift, um, night shift or whatever. And that was at, like, 500 rand. A month. So that's a lot of money for very, um, for very poor accommodation in terms of security of tenure, access to services, um, obviously they're very overcrowded, lack of privacy. And I mean, what's probably the most shocking about this is the response of a municipality like the city of Johannesburg, who actually advocates for this as a solution. So, I mean, in our work in the inner city, where a lot of it is around um, assisting communities who are being evicted from buildings that have been bought by, by private owners, and, and we, if they're earning you know, below amounts that would be able to allow them to rent on the, on the rental market or on the formal rental market or on, in social housing, which, like Louis said, is, there's hardly any of it actually available, and there's waiting lists that go on forever, so you're, you're never going to get in there. Um, but to try and push for some kind of temporary accommodation. We've, we've been told that our, our clients are, are lazy, they're, they're clearly not informed, they don't realize that there's accommodation, sharing accommodation in Yeovil and in Hillbrow, which they could go to, which would be affordable. Um, and when we raised to them that this, you know, this, this kind of accommodation actually, it's, not, it's actually not legal in many respects, it's not formal, it's not you know, formally registered, these are people who are sub subletting rooms, um, so there is an issue of you not actually, you don't actually even have a proper rental agreement with the owner um, because you're subletting. They said that, they, that they, they're facilitating it by not um, enforcing the bylaws there, which is quite a shocking, and I mean this is in meetings, but as well in, in some of the court papers that they filed in response to some of the cases. So there's this sort of, the sense of the private sector 
is taking care of it. Um, and very much a, and a lack, and I think it is because of some of the historical problems with public housing and rent collection, and obviously the politics around that was huge. Um, and so there's been, the, the appetite for public housing is, is very, very low, if not non-existent. Um, and I think the other issue, and you find this within municipalities themselves, even ones like City of Joburg who are, you know, who are, who've got capacity, there's this, this sort of, um, this, this, uh, this acknowledgement of this, the, the state is being extremely weak. Um, and, and in fact, um, you know, even within government, you will say, but wh why are you trying to get us to do this? Because we can't do this, and you know we can't do this, and, you know, focus on here, focus on elsewhere, focus on the private sector. The reality is when it comes to sort of actually transforming the apartheid landscape, you, the private sector is not going to do it. There's no profit margins in providing for the poor. There's no incentives, um, really, I think, at the moment that they can put in place to do it. And in fact, what is, what is crazy is that, I mean, like Joburg wants to basically have its cake and eat it because while it says we want to facilitate the private sector to deal with this, to provide accommodation, um, and, and they, say, they'll, they even say that they, they can't do it. It's impossible for them to do it because they're not going to make profit. They need some form of subsidy. There's a massive gap in terms of policy and a subsidy mechanism that can actually ensure affordable rental. Um, at the same time that the city is saying this, it then takes a decision to, to go to court around applying commercial rates on, on rental and residential accommodation in the inner city. So if you have some uh, shops on the bottom, which is most buildings, shops on the bottom and then um, residential accommodation on top, they want to charge the entire building on commercial rates, which are about three times higher than residential rates. So, you know, social housing um, institutions are struggling. Other private developers are struggling and there's not, um, and I mean, they don't even serve the poor. I mean, on their, on their, own, on their own definition of social housing, the, the policy is explicit that it doesn't cater for poor people. I mean, even the 30%, the which still, um, I think, is quite strange that 30%, that you say your primary target market is people who earn between 1,500 and 3,500, but in fact, you only have to provide 30%. Um, and obviously the rest is 70%, and that's basically your upper end of people earning, you know, sort of like 6,000, 7,000 rand. So there's a massive problem in terms of, of the priorities, and I think, I mean, the, the focus on municipalities is definitely one on maximizing revenue. It's a very neoliberal approach, we feel, um, internally in, in municipalities to, to their business, and it's very much seen as a business. And it's also very much seen as being focused more and more, we're, we, we're getting this the sense from, from municipalities is that they, they want to focus on the aspirant middle class. So there's a sense that there's a group of people, and I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a relevant issue that there's a group of people who are sort of just getting by and that they may, may slip into poverty and that there needs to be a focus on making sure that they stay there and assisting them. But I mean, in terms of, of all of the, the law and policy and regulation, municipalities must have a pro poor approach first and then deal with other things. So, so there's sort of a, and I think it is a sense of it just being an overwhelming, intractable problem that can never be dealt with. But I think that's, that's not true. And there are solutions, there are gaps in national policy, I think, um, and, and, and issues around funding which need to be addressed. But like Tambani said, I mean, it's really much more an issue of political will. So when you see a focus on the middle class, you, you, you start to realize that, you know, that's not just coming from officials, that's coming from the politicians are coming from council as well, and there are, there are these tensions, but there's overwhelming a sense of, of focusing on a sort of a higher, higher income bracket and kind of just hoping that this other thing, which just seems too big to deal with, um, is going to sort itself out. Um, I think in terms of, of a rights-based approach, sort of mixed with this, this a developmental local government that focuses on poor people and ensures spatial transformation, I mean, that's... That's the way we have to go, and I think that's the way municipalities and government speaks in terms of their own policies, and, and you'll hear it all the time, but I mean, the reality is that that talk is very cheap, and that it's not happening on the ground when it comes to, when it comes to crunch time in terms of decisions around, around prioritizing and, and sort of revenue versus transformation. Um, and you can, you can argue that, well, if you, if you put something on a piece of land that's going to have a lot of rate, rates and taxes for your municipality, then you can use that elsewhere. But it's unclear if that's happening. So that argument is problematic in itself. 
I don't know if I have any more time. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't looking at you, so I could just carry on. <laughs> but it's fine, I'll end there. Well, thank you, Kate. Thank you.